<laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Arjun Dev Arora. I am the founder and managing partner of Valence Advisory. Uh, we support funds and founders uh, and help accelerate their efforts through strategy, capital, and people. Off to John. Great. Thank you, Arjun. So John Lowe here. I'm advisor at Valence Advisory. I'm the lead on uh, leadership and communications coaching, and I collaborate closely with Arjun, doing some great work with uh, founders and funders. Today, we have a special guest. All our guests are special. His name is Adam Lawrence. He is a founder, serial founder. He operates at the C level, and we're really grateful to have you on this podcast, Adam. So to kick us off, why don't you tell us what your current role is and what you're working on now? Now, and we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm currently the COO at a company called Bolt. What I'm working on right now, a lot of coronavirus-related things, as you can imagine, given the time frame. But outside of that, um, working on enterprise sales and then growing our company from about 150 people to 200 this year. Great, great. And so, Adam, uh, my understanding this is obviously not your first company that you've operated yeah. at a leadership or C level. Can you unpack a bit about your journey into tech? and into the space of being a founder and building companies from zero to one. Yeah, I grew up partially in Silicon Valley, so I was exposed to technology from a young age. My dad was a banker for a lot of technology companies. In undergrad, I took a pretty traditional finance route for a while. So I did a iBanking internship and a trading internship and quickly realized that neither one of those environments was a great fit for me. Like many then, I took a little time off from school and I worked for two startups absolutely loved the environments. You know, it wasn't necessarily in love with what the companies were doing, but I loved the fact that the things that I did could contribute to the company right away. You'd work today and see the impact of your work tomorrow type thing. There, you know, really had the bug in terms of kind of joining and building a venture funded startup. So high growth ended up post undergrad joining as a first employee at a fintech company. Great. Thank you. And so my understanding is you have an awareness now that one of the special skills you have is actually synthesizing strategy into a key set of actions that will actually help companies or teams achieve their goals. How did you start to figure out that that was an area that one could say is an unfair advantage for you? Because, you know, if you're growing from zero to one, a lot of times you're just a small team, right? Of like a handful of people and then growing from there, you know? Yeah, it's a hard question because I think you kind of know it when you see it to some extent, but I think the things that kind of clicked for me is that coming to the realization that the innovation in building companies is not in building companies, but is solely in the product and the technology that you're delivering. That Silicon Valley has this history and story of mentorship and development, you know, whether it's uh, people investing in companies after they've done well and building the next stage, or, you know, it's the 30, 40, 50 years of history of people starting things in their garage. And you can lean on the shoulders of giants for a lot of this stuff. And so if you do that enough, you can create pattern recognition about how to synthesize who you are and say, okay, great. I've seen something like this before. Or if I haven't seen this, I know somebody that's seen it, or I've seen this story or I've read this book or, you know, listen to that podcast that allows you to create a mosaic and a pattern that you can say, okay, great. We're here. We need to go there. How do we bridge that gap? And then if you've hired well and you've figured out, you know, appropriate product market fit, the product stuff should take care of itself. Uh, in the sense that you have to work hard on it every single day, but you should do for the rest of the business, the things that other people have done really well. Great. Thank you. And in, in kind of scaling your leadership through people, yeah. obviously hiring, you know, setting performance expectations and leading their personal and professional development is a key aspect. Can you unpack a bit about your personal process or internal model for onboarding and constructing high performing teams where, you know, one plus one is much greater than three. We might call it talent chemistry. Yeah. I think the first thing I realized is that it's way easier to hire well than to try to manage potential underperformers. And so taking your time in the front part of the process in terms of spending time to get to know people, doing a lot of conversations and keeping the bar incredibly high is really important. Oftentimes, I think founders and young teams are willing to sacrifice the talent bar in order to fill in some sort of need that just punts problems further down the road. And so first thing is, you know, keep that talent bar incredibly high and don't relent on it. And then two, when you get people, uh, you need to invest in them. And so that uh, is everything from context. How do we get here today to you know, strategy? Where are we going? Particularly for roles that you've done as either an individual or as a team, building out the appropriate documentation so somebody doesn't have to learn from scratch. And so at Bolt, we have a strong playbook culture, something that we're incredibly proud of that, you know, if we're doing things more than twice, we're documenting it. 
and writing it down, not only so we can test, iterate, and improve, but also so we can scale it laterally. And so it can be a bit overwhelming for some come in and see all these playbooks and all this written material, but two or three weeks into the job, provided that they've gone through onboarding with our team uh, and with their managers, you know, they have a huge head start over some of those things themselves. Great. Thank you. And, and just kind of, you, you said something interesting about uh, spending a lot of time in setting the bar for hiring. How have you personally and with your team filtered out like personal bias in the process so that you don't lose out on diversity of opinion, thought and talent? Yeah, it's really hard because, you know, (laughs) (laughs) unconscious bias by nature is unconscious, right? It's not looking you in the face every single day. So I think it starts with creating a spec of exactly what you want. And that spec needs to clearly articulate the skill sets and the outputs that you want to see from that role. Um, And then you need to apply that through each one of your hiring conversations in a way that you are articulating the interview process to suss those things out. And so if you're looking for a great salesperson, the mental model for a typical great salesperson is, you know, someone boisterous, an ex-college athlete that's willing to stand in a chair and rah, 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 get the team going. But if you look at the archetypes of great salespeople, you know, that could be one, but it's not every archetype and it's certainly not the pattern of what's been successful. The pattern of what's been successful is somebody that, you know, over history of their career is delivered at or above quota again and again and again, and has strong mental models for developing teams, strong tool set for, you know, scaling sales organizations, for sales ops or rev ops. And so if you're having those conversations and looking for actual evidence that supports the ability to do those things, you end up removing a lot of the bias from, you know, just going for that raw, raw salesperson for this example. Nicely said. Uh, Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Just for context, my understanding is also you've had experience scaling teams from single digits to well over a hundred. And obviously that comes with its own set of challenges. But as you look back at your career across multiple startups, and including the current one you're in, which is Bolt Financial. What are some key challenges that stick out to you or um, that you, you solve for or learned a lot from? And uh, yeah, if you could unpack some of that, I think that would be really helpful for some of our viewers. Yeah, I'd say the first time I did this, I did... I don't want to say everything wrong, but many things. And so, you know, here's some things that we we did wrong and tried to address in future iterations. You know, I think if you have a team of 20 and you're hiring somebody of mid-career, they're going to ask for a VP title because they can ask for it, right? It's going to make hiring a lot harder later. It's going to make your organizational design a lot harder later. People end up craving structure in order to give them goalposts and kind of a mission. And if you don't provide that structure early, people end up floundering. Not everybody knows what it takes to go from one to two to three to four. And so being able to break down both that career development aspect, but also the organizational structure aspect of saying, okay, your part of the machine is in charge of this type of output. Here's how we know this is going well. Here's a clear set of expectations. I think early in my career, we hired a lot of people that looked like us in the sense that they were smart, young, and ambitious, but not everybody could conceptualize what it took to build a business. And it took us a long time to figure out where that cognitive gap was. That, hey, we said go do sales and we've got no sales from this team. And uh, you know, it turns out that people didn't know how to do that. And so the approach that we took at Bolt was very different. From day one, a strong sense of leveling, strong sense of what each role took, strong sense of performance management, strong sense of measurement and output and articulation, OKRs, key results, measurement. And then as we've grown from the executive team, you know, driving that into the way in which we run the business. And so Monday, start with the scorecard, for example, scorecard goes through each department. What do we measure? What do we look at? What do we look at for early indicators and lagging indicators? Eventually that boils down to results. In the case of our business, that's uh, sales revenue, you know, as it is for most, but having a good focus on, you know, what does it take to do things well and driving that into the roles, the positions, and the way that you're building the organization. Thanks. By the sounds of your language, you didn't figure it out, all this out alone. You used a lot of we. Does that include peers or would you say, well, there's some significant mentors who provided a guiding light for you during the early stages of your development? Yes to all those things. But, you know, when I say we, I think of any time that you have like an epiphany or realization, it's usually the culmination of a bunch of small things that get you there. And then suddenly there's an aha moment, right? I tend to think of these things as, you know, a lot of brainstorming to everybody comes with a slightly different opinion and you get something that's better, you know, thinking about things like that in terms of the management example, or, you know, fall into that category that you have a bunch of little conversations in the gate there. But 
In terms of mentorship, I've been really lucky to work with a bunch of amazing people throughout my career. So, you know, my first full-time gig out of school, um, I was the first employee at this startup and the founder had started a company called Palantir before that. Getting that type of experience in terms of seeing what greatness looks like up close early in your career, it changes the trajectory of how hard you're going to work and what you want to achieve early. Um, it's really hard to do that later in life. You know, an analogy is exercise, right? If you run every day, it's pretty easy. But if you don't run for a year and you try to start it again, it's not. And kind of that bar of what high quality work looks like is very similar to exercise, right? There's rigor behind it. There's effort behind it. Outside of, you know, working for great people, I got exposed to people that have done greatness in other companies as well. And so now I'm at a place where I think I can see things that they're great at that are individual skill sets that are not just them great as a person, if that makes sense. And so, you know, no one person I think you should put on a pedestal, but, you know, everybody has something that they spike in. And the goal is to figure out how and why they spike in that and then what things you can take from that and apply it to, you know, your own efforts or, you know, my own efforts there. Great. Thanks. So I say like, were there any other moments of fortune that as you reflect on your career as a a founder and a leader that were very helpful for your trajectory? One is obviously you you had an early days, you had a benchmark for what high performance looked like, right? Were there any other serendipitous events or occurrences, whether drip, drip or big ahas that you consider yourself to be quite grateful for? Yeah, quite a few. Like I'm a, I'm a big believer in luck in the sense that you manufacture it. You put yourself in a position where you can take advantage of it. So that's saying yes to a lot of things, you know, that's having a positive outlook there. That's, you know, being open uh, and having a growth mindset. Um, if I think of my career in Silicon Valley, like it very much starts with luck. I was an undergrad who wasn't going to school, came back and was able to, to get into a program for, graduate students to be paired with uh, venture and startup mentors. I believe I was the only undergrad in that program. Applied late, I wasn't in school before that, but that program ended up, you know, connecting me with a bunch of people that both pushed my thinking about what I want to do, but ended up leading to a fortuitous email introduction to the person that came my first boss. You know, complete luck that the, got into the program, got mentored by a VC who had blindly invested in a successful entrepreneur, and then, you know, completely did basically a blind intro from me to him and said, hey, you should meet this person. I think you guys will get along. Life's full of those things. And, you know, it's because I said yes, because I pushed a little bit, because I showed up and because I got into the program. I think a lot of kind of my best hires fall into that camp as well. I think a lot of them came from, you know, referrals of somebody that, you know, maybe I didn't even work with, you know, I interviewed and it didn't work out for some reason, but they had a good experience and I had a good experience and they referred somebody. So like I think about Bolt, for example, and I think we've hired three people that were referred by an intern that I had eight years ago. Wow. You know, like (laughs) fortuitous and lucky that both, you know, that intern who now is a partner at a venture firm, uh, thought of us, had a great network, you know, made good recommendations that fit what we were looking for. And like, you know, I think of that as luck. Like plenty of people make introductions. Not all of them are good, but we say yes to a lot of them. Nice. And, you know, as you continue to grow in your capacity as a COO and as a leader in your career, what do you see uh, some of growth edges or areas that you're focusing on at this stage in your career? I think there's a few, you know, one, it's really easy to have a lot of false confidence because you have a title, you've been promoted or things like that. But when you're looking at a challenging time, how do you trust your gut and how do you bring the team along with you? You know, I'd say that's leadership at scale there. And the difference between doing that at an executive level and doing that as, you know, a strong contributor in a 60 person startup, uh, it's pretty significant because you're not just having a bunch of one-on-one conversations. You're figuring out how to communicate that to the entire team and figuring out how to get each individual part of those teams uh, to row in the same direction. And so, you know, I, I look at that as something that I'm always trying to get better at. And I think, you know, the current environment is a great example of that, trying to figure out what do we need to do? What are our opportunities? What are the things that we need to mitigate against in case of risk? And then how do we communicate to that team? There's an analogy that, you know, when you're on a boat, you don't have to worry about the storm waters around you. You have to worry about the storm waters that get into the boat. Think a lot about that. Like, how can we get everybody going exactly the same direction and all unified against whatever storms are on the outside? 
Thank you. And what are some of the things for context that uh, you've personally trialed out with Bolt during this transition to remote due to mass events? What are some of the things you've tried out that you've noticed have paid off maybe in a 10x way of uh, little things that have made quite a big difference uh, for teams who are looking to stay aligned and ruin the same direction remotely, you know? Let's start off with the failure mode there. And I think the failure okay. mode for remote work is pretty simple. It's that you try to work remotely the same way that you work in the office. And if you do that, it just doesn't work, right? If you just move every meeting to Zoom, you're still in meetings all day. You're still, you know, chatting. Now it's a little bit buggier and like you can't have, you know, conversations with your neighbors quite as well. So we try to look at that and we try to articulate what does it mean to actually be good at remote work? And I think what it means is that people get more deep thought time. They're interrupted less. In order to enable that, though, we have to get better at sharing context around uh, what people are doing, what their peers are doing, and what the business is doing. And so like this week, for example, a strong focus on taking communication from one-to-one -one modalities, so like Slack direct messages and emails, for example, and pushing them into shared channels. So why shared channels? It creates context-rich environment for everybody else in that team. So if you're going to ask Bob, hey, Bob, is the system up today? You know, a, a generic question. But if you ask Bob directly, Bob knows, you know. But if you ask in the channel and Bob replies, everybody knows. And then, you know, technology is the place where you control your notifications, can control your amount of interruptions. And so you can just, you know, turn those off, right? In the same way that you have your phone on Do Not Disturb. But having context-rich communication that everybody has access to, I think is, you know, the thing that we're focused on. I think the thing that will yield greater results and if we get in the habit of doing that and we go back to our office in two months, um, I think we'll be better for it as well. Well, wow, nicely said. Nicely said. And, you know, one of the things I think Arjun and I can both speak to this that we think is quite unique with you is you have this balance between gut and instinct, but like pragmatic rationale in your decision-making process. As you anticipate the workforce moving back into in-person and the shelter in place being lifted, right? What do you think are some of the key tectonic plates uh, team collaboration that might change permanently or for a more extended period of time after this external shock is well over? You know, every, everybody's read some version of a tweet that says, you know, you couldn't do online classes because you had to be in person, right? I had to go to the office because they said it was mandatory that we collaborate there. And, you know, for the most part, business is going on and going forward. And so I, I would expect that people look at a lot of those things and say that, hey, talent is distributed broadly, not just in the Bay Area, or New York or large metropolitan areas. Many companies already have multiple offices anyways. How do we enable our workforce to work remotely? How do we hire remotely and how do we bring them in? If companies can do that, I think it'll accelerate a lot of hiring. I mean, the Bay Area, you know, particularly with housing, has made it incredibly expensive to hire and incredibly challenging to hire there. And if you can hire the same you know, quality of talent, you've already built that muscle to incorporate them in your business, I think you'll be at a tremendous advantage. Nice, he's sad, so succinct. He's clearly thought about this. And given the economic climate, just a way to close out this interview or this uh, podcast, during these tough times, what opportunity do you see lies for emerging founder talent and also like just talent in general who might be in the market looking for their next opportunity because they got laid off yeah. from another company? Founder, I think it's an opportunity to build resiliency. I think of this as you know, a, a time to build your army in terms of uh, people and talent. What I mean by that is if you're willing to flex and do hard things for your people, I think you'll leave this time with an amazing amount of goodwill with your team. Um, the second part of your question is people that is laid off. And I can tell you that every company that's laying off people right now, you know, there's things that they can do in their business to hold tight for a little while if that's what they wanted to do, right? You can cut salaries across the board. You can change investments here. You can reallocate talent from one team to another team where the opportunities lie. Certainly not every business can do that, right? If you're a travel business, for example, there's just not a lot of travel going on right now. Um, but if you are in a business where you can make investments in people, I think now is the time to do that. Um, if you're talent looking for an opportunity, um, I think it's gonna be challenging for a little while. I think it's gonna be challenging for, you know, few weeks, a month, maybe more there as businesses figure out what their needs are. But if you're willing to take a little bit of risk, I think you can probably find uh, opportunities that are really unique during this time. 
So whether that's companies that are holding out, finding out the absolute best person for them, or people building things in light of challenging economic times tend to build pretty interesting things. And so, you know, I think about this, you know, post 9-11, a bunch of really interesting things built, particularly, you know, around the culmination of both social and deep tech. Right. Not together, certainly, but like, you know, people did hard things there where they said, we'll buckle down for a while. We'll figure out how to get it done. And they left building with amazing innovation. So I think there's an opportunity to find things like that, that, you know, it's not a gig for you. It's like, you know, likely a calling something that will last for many years and, you know, leave that type of experience with just a tremendous wealth of knowledge. Nicely said. Well, thanks, Adam. I think that's a good place to leave the mic on the table. Thanks for sharing so much insight and being so clear and succinct. I think uh, Arjun and I both really enjoy this. 